Well, good afternoon uh, and welcome. I'm Merit Jano, Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to have a conversation uh, with Judith Roden, someone I know well and admire greatly and has uh, recently during this COVID period produced a really important book called Making Money Moral. I will introduce her more fully in a second. Uh, as well as Keiko Honda. Um, so thank you both very much for being with us. And thank you to our perhaps um, nearly 300 attendees uh, from all over the world. Uh, it's um, not only uh, uh, the opportunity of, uh, of uh, the Zoom world in which we're a virtual world, but also uh, really a testament, Judith, to you and this book. Uh, as well as the pleasure of having Keiko Honda join us in this conversation. Now, Judith Roden is an extraordinary individual. For our students who may not know all of her history, you have a brief bio. She is a pioneer in many uh, dimensions, um, an innovator, a change maker. These are often terms used to describe Judith. You know, for over two decades, she really led and transformed two global institutions. The University of Pennsylvania, where she was a president and indeed the first, I think, female Ivy president. She was also provost at Yale and um, uh, was also a Columbia PhD in psychology. And um, I'm very proud of her for all of that. Uh, and was also, of course, running the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, and in that leadership role, uh, she really uh, ushered in a new era of, of what is called strategic philanthropy um, and championed, I think, new fields uh, that have been very influential around resilience and impact investing. Life is intruding in my phone, so let me turn that off. Apologies for that. Uh, Judith Roden has also served on the board of directors of leading corporations, public companies, private companies, and numerous uh, venture-backed businesses, uh, as well as other nonprofits. And I think that I mentioned also because it's a perspective that contributes, I think, to what you are able to do uh, in this book. She has 19 honorary degrees, has authored hundreds of articles, written many, many books, um, including um, uh, an important one on the resilience dividend, bringing being strong in a world where things go wrong, which I think of as possibly uh, foundational for, for this further uh, co-authored uh, work. And with us to join Judith uh, in this conversation with me is Keiko Honda, who's an adjunct professor and, and senior research scholar at SIPA where she's teaching a, a seminar on uh, ESG, environmental, social, and governance matters, and investing uh, to our graduate students. Um, uh, Keiko, uh, until the end of 2019, was the chief executive officer of the multilateral investment guarantee agency, MIGA, which is the political risk insurance and credit enhancement arm of the World Bank. Uh, before MIGA, um, uh, Keiko Hondo was the first woman senior partner in Asia at McKinsey and Company. And so um, she brings, you know, extraordinary deep uh, private sector experience and public experience. And also, I, I, I heard earlier, is a proud Wharton um, graduate as well. So thank you, um, Keiko, for, for being with us. So Judith, if I may, um, could I just invite you to tell our audience about this book, what led you uh, to write it, what you feel are the main messages um, uh, you, you wanna be sure uh, that your readership understands. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's great to be with you, all of you, and uh, with Dean Jano and with you, Keiko. I, it, it's just a delight for all of us to uh, get together and think through this extraordinarily important topic. Um, I also want to thank Dean Jano with this audience in particular for being just incredibly hospitable to me when I left Rockefeller and asked me to join SEPA as a senior fellow. And uh, it's been a terrific experience. And so I've, I've learned a lot. I've met wonderful colleagues um, and I'm very grateful, Merrick, for the opportunity. And I wanted to be able to express that, especially to uh, this group. 
Um, I tried to think of what the kind of tagline, the cliff notes of, of making money moral would be. Um, the uh, subtitle is how a new wave of visionaries is linking purpose and profit. But generally, I, I would say that making money moral occurs when the bold world of finance meets the aspirational world of impact. And when those two come together, I think magic really happens. Um, we were motivated at this point, my colleague uh, Sadia Mosberg and I, Sadia led the Innovative Finance Initiative for us at Rockefeller while I was president. Um, and we were motivated at this moment because by the end of 2018, when we started thinking about the book, um, there were already globally almost $30 trillion of assets under management in what could be called or what was being called um, sustainable and impact investing. So this was no longer a niche market. In fact, um, today uh, it's estimated that in the US one out of every $3 invested is in some kind of fund that or, or activity, um, company fund, um, and a variety of other things because we've seen explosion in every asset class, um, which is another reason that we were motivated to write this book. Uh, we at Rockefeller hosted a uh, meeting at our Bellagio Conference Center in Italy in 2007, and we brought together a group of investors and a group of entrepreneurs, and it was actually at that meeting that the term impact investing was coined. Um, and they decided that there really was something um, in the opportunity of, of transforming lives and livelihoods and indeed the environment and making a profit at the same time, that the two weren't mutually exclusive, that they were already seeing green shoots of opportunities. But it was a small and very disorganized field. And when we heard them and really thought through what we as a foundation could do, um, we decided that we would help to build the infrastructure for this field. Because um, if we could accelerate the supply side, how the money got organized, how investors um, made decisions, how they did their due diligence and the like, that we could help to both grow the field, but also have enough momentum and enough years of experience to know where the field was wrong, um, where it had gone astray and, and where it was succeeding and help to really make some of those adjustments. So in those early days, um, for the next five years, we invested through grant making about $60 million in building the platforms, building out the earliest metrics, working with policymakers on what kinds of policy frameworks would help to accelerate the field, and then working with impact investors themselves, which, who at the time were largely um, small funds, family offices, um, private individuals who really wanted to as they would tell us, not do their charity with their right hand and their financial investing with their left hand, but somehow think about blending these two. Against the background of that, we're really two extraordinarily, I would say, important accelerating trends. One was the growth of conscious consumerism. And actually that was accelerating on college campuses. Students didn't want to wear athletic wear or university labeled clothes. Um, when they learned that the clothes were made in, in sweatshops um, in places in the world that were horrific in terms of women's and children's rights in particular, um, as well as the degradation of the environment. And I think today we see conscious consumerism uh, really influencing so much of our behaviors and particularly in millennials. They don't wanna work for companies that are destroying the environment or destroying social or human rights. They don't wanna buy products from those companies. So set that aside, conscious consumerism was one major trend. The other was really the rise of, or the opposition to the Milton Friedman notion of shareholder primacy. 
that the role of capitalism really was to serve only the shareholder. And for 25 years, um, that has been the sort of ascendant framework um, for many investors. But about 10 years ago, a group really began to push on the notion that um, companies need to consider a broader group of stakeholders, um, their customers, their employees, the people who live in places where they work, and the environment as a stakeholder as well. Um, and this broadening notion of the responsibility of both companies and of capitalism in general, I think has become um, extremely important. So we wrote the book to explain and evaluate the dynamic market that uh, we think we're in. We were surprised since the 2007 meeting and our early work where we thought that impact investing would be a single asset class. Um, and what has happened, of course, is that it is in absolutely every asset class. Um, in public and private equities, venture capital, real estate investment trusts, all kinds of ETF funds, and explosively in fixed income, um, and many other innovations in other alternatives asset classes as well, um, energy traded funds and the like. So, so much innovation going on that has led to the kind of investment um, that I talked about, the, the $30 trillion. Um, so we wanted to identify the key players at this moment. We wanted to showcase the most promising approaches um, uh, for double bottom line investing. Um, and also because we've seen the problems as well as the promise um, to do this with a very kind of green eye shade way, um, particularly because it has moved so explosively, um, especially in large funds. It was private, it's so public now. You see BlackRock, of course, um, the largest um, fund um, being in the vanguard, but also Wellington and State Street. We see on the fixed income side, all the fixed income vendors, as well as corporations and governments um, issuing bonds um, that are uh, green bonds or social bonds or resilience bonds. So our goal is to say, whoa, <laughs> let's look at this. Um, let's understand who the asset owners are and what they're looking for and what their obligations are. Let's look at the money manager, the asset managers, um, and what they're doing and how they're doing it. And then of course, let's look at the recipients of this kind of funding. And one thing we do that's different, I think from how it's usually explained in the market, um, we're not only looking at the companies, uh, both public and private that receive these investments, but we're looking at the large NGOs and the philanthropies and the government entities like the UN and the World Bank um, that are such a critical part of this ecosystem and are really partnering um, in very unique ways to help uh, this field explode, um, both with their resources, but more importantly, with their knowledge. Thank you very much. That's a great introduction. And by the way, if I didn't mention it, uh, I think the link uh, to this event also tells you where you can get this book, which is just coming out. Um, and um, as uh, uh, and 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 I strongly recommend you take a look. Um, you know, um, Dr. Roden is uh, very generous to reference that she has uh, spent some time with us after leaving Rockefeller. We're very grateful to you for doing that and continuing to be part of our community. And I think this is an area of of deep interest in our students because they come to a school of public policy. Uh, with deep conviction around wanting to contribute to the world, but do that often uh, in the private sector, in government and through NGOs. So that sense of public purpose uh, is taken forward uh, in their lives. And this is one way in which uh, this is occurring. Uh, 
But the university, I would say the academy, not SIPA, where we're putting time and effort into teaching new courses and thinking about this, and I'll invite Keiko uh, Honda, who's teaching such a course, to speak to it. But still, these areas are relatively understudied in the academy, and the movement is still relatively new uh, to think about um, uh, you know, how uh, such funds are actually being deployed and their consequences. And I think Keiko, uh, you've done some thinking about, uh, about this as well. Could I invite you to take us forward uh, with some perspectives and questions for Dr. Roden? Well, thank you, Mary. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me here. Also, it is my honor to, um, to be in the same panel with the um, President Roden. She made, actually she transformed University of Pennsylvania as a leader to transforming social side of the school. I think, you know, that story you definitely should hear, but I think today I'm supposed to talk about ESG investing. So let me go back to track. By the way, I read The Making Money Moral. It's a very interesting book. I think I would highly recommend all of you to read it. I think it was on the market yesterday, am I correct? Yesterday, yes. So now you can read. Then uh, reading the book, I completely agree with the um, Judy's that a private and a public investors have made a major progress in creating positive environmental social impact. With impact investing, investors seek both social or environmental impact as well as financial returns. But due to the high bar, the assets invested under the impact investing are still only around $60 billion, while ESG investing has over $30 trillion. To create larger social and environmental impact, we have two paths. A, making sure the investment are truly uh, having a positive impact, no ESG washing, no uh, impact washing. Also be expanding the total asset under the management. So the second path to create a larger impact is expanding total assets, especially get more money in. Including ESG investing have maybe a good option. Although there is no single great definition based on my interviews of 27 large in, uh, investors with an aggregate asset under management of $22 trillion, ESG investing is often defined as investing that are reflect non-financial consideration or ESG factors in evaluation, mitigating risk, and also unlock the opportunity in the portfolio to create above market returns. There is a glowing agreement that there uh, is a need to address infectious disease in addition to the climate and social inequality. Many anticipate changes in regulations will be put in place to address these issues. We are beginning to see evidence that asset prices such as those for sustainability linked bonds and loans are changing to reflect these new reality. Therefore, in other words, from the perspective of investment performance, it may make sense for even traditional investors who are simply seeking the financial return should engage in ESG investing because asset pricing is changing. What, uh, Judith, what do you think about this way of thinking? Um, I, I think you, thank you for that articulation, um, a way of making it vivid. Um, I just read, I think it's uh, Bloomberg Green today, the Bloomberg Climate. Um, that last year, governments, corporations, and other groups last year alone raised $490 billion selling green social and sustainability bonds, and a further $347 billion poured into ESG investment funds. So this is just on the public side. Um, we don't have a similar metric on the, on the private and alternative side, but it's, it's exploding. So the worry underlying your comments and your question is really, could everything um, that's getting all of this money really deserve either an ESG or impact label? Um, and I, in my view, the answer is no. 
And I think there are multiple problems. First of all, because the field is exploding, um, right now there are no standardized accepted metrics. What I would say is that as I think of ESG, um, first of all, it's more widely, it's more widely used in the public markets, uh, both in debt and equity. And that I view it as a signal and a screen. Um, it's signaling a certain kind of commitment and it's a screen that eliminates other uh, more damaging activities. Um, typically ESG measures are yes, no. Um, so there's no nuance about how much positive environmental or how much positive social, but just yes or no, do they do this or that? So don't harm the environment um, is sort of the most limited part of the checklist for E. Don't hurt people um, is the most limited part for S. And have accepted standards of governance is really the most limited baseline threshold for G. Anybody who's doing less than that should not merit an ESG designation. So that's number one. Um, and the question is, uh, how do we get to standardization? There's a lot of good work going on. Certainly the SASB standards are starting to really try to look at materiality, the kind of so what, you know, if you're doing this, so what? Um, what should we be evaluating you on? I think uh, that's, that's really important. Um, and I think there will be pressure on the part of the asset owners to get to standardization. Um, they are press, really pressing on um, the sustainability metrics companies, and many of them have exploded. And we're seeing like S&P and Moody, Moody's buying them up. Um, it's estimated that um, hundreds of millions of dollars is already going into just the ESG rating industry, let alone anything else. So that will cause pressure for consolidation um, on the ESG ratings. Um, but I think um, there are three additional trends that make me think that ESG will change. Um, and then I'll go to impact uh, for a moment. But um, I do think that there's a lot of discussion in the past six months about expanding and improving the metrics because of the pandemic um, and because of the economic uh, um, impact of the pandemic. So for the E, I think the pandemic has really escalated our awareness of the interconnectedness between or among the economy, human health, the climate and natural ecosystems. And it has definitely convinced the markets that we're not any, they are um, any longer not going to be able to uh, outrun the risks of climate change um, and the like. And so E will be more attentive to um, other elements besides just uh, carbon reduction. Um, and we're seeing a whole lot of new metrics come um, uh, in that are very exciting and uh, important, in particularly around natural ecosystems, which is the, the underpinning of environment um, and an important one. Um, so it's going, we're going to look at biodiversity, we're going to look at natural resources like water impacts and the like, um, and not just carbon. Um, for the S, I think it's certainly the case that the pandemic is prompting investors to apply much greater scrutiny um, to the way that companies protect the health and safety of their workers, um, their suppliers, their contractors. Um, uh, and so the S is going to expand, I think, significantly um, as a result of this. And for the G, and we're already seeing this, it isn't just does a company have good governance, um, it's is the board, are the corporate leaders really willing to step up um, and take a role and take a stand 
um, on environmental issues, on social issues, as we've seen many of them do, that not only are they doing it, but do we hold them accountable? Do we measure it not only when they issue the statement, but looking over time at their actual outcomes? Um, so often ESG, as I said, is the screen at the beginning rather than part of the performance metric um, that's monitored in an ongoing way. And I, I, I think that's going to change. Um, I, I do think, as I said, the second trend is that we are going to see more consolidation and more rigor. Um, and the third, and, and I think a really important and interesting one, and Satya and I talk about this a little in our um, uh, HBR article that just got posted yesterday. So um, please take a look at that audience if you're interested. Um, but that article was really focused on new kinds of collaborations that are emerging in these fields that themselves are going to lead to transformation. So um, let's take one example. Um, Merit invited me to use some of our examples from the book. Um, suppose you have a situation where both the investor and the company lacks relevant um, on the ground experience. And so here's where we're starting to see the role of NGOs that have that kind of experience come in and work with the investors and work with the companies. So one example um, that we talk about is a, a really interesting engagement between um, Norgis Bank Investment Management, MBIM, um, which manages the $1.2 trillion Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, um, and a collaboration between them and UNICEF um, and the companies that the NBIM invested in. So UNICEF and NBIM uh, about two years ago started a collaboration to try to understand and then really advance in significant ways, corporate policies and practices that would strengthen children's rights. And more than just being free of child labor, but what's the obligation and treatment of the children of, their, of the factory workers or the obligation to the children who are members of the communities around these factories that often are doing um, environmentally or socially destructive things. Um, and they convened some of their companies, the companies that they invested in, uh, that are huge, Adidas, um, uh, Yves Saint Laurent, H&M, to be part of the conversation. Um, UNICEF had a great deal of research that they could bring to the table. And here's a place where NGOs and academics who have terrific research really need to be in the room and need to be part of the conversation. So they had research from fac factory and community assessments, I think both from Vietnam and Bangladesh. Um, and so they were able to see what actions were most effective in really creating positive impacts for children, not just what sounded good, um, like uh, children, how you treat the parents affects the child's education outcomes or uh, how they allow and, and treat breastfeeding or maternity leave obviously affects children's health outcomes. And after a very extensive two-year engagement in 2020, they issued a really rigorous guide and set of policies um, for their portfolio companies that they expect them to uphold um, they will monitor their progress. Again, the portfolio companies were invested in, were involved in the discussion as well. Um, I give this example because I think it's one of many in bringing um, the NGO sector into this field um, in new ways and exciting ways. Um, and the rigor of their research and academic research will advance, I think, and benefit um, ESG measurement going forward. I'll just say a brief word about impact because I think Merritt will want to talk about measurement um, it, you know, in a moment. Um, but I see impact metrics as being uh, an addition to ESG and different from them in, in two ways. First of all, they're way more likely to be used in the private equity and venture and 
um, REITs, I mean, the non-public um, market. Um, and secondly, they're much more focused on outcomes. And so they not only use initial screens, but they are quite rigorous about determining what um, is material and um, monitoring those outcomes quite significantly. Where they will start to merge, and I'm seeing this in the SPAC fervor um, that is overtaking the markets, is as these companies who are supported by VC and private equity come out, um, into the public markets, if they want to be part of ESG funds and their metrics are so much more advanced than typical ESG metrics, how will that really also start to accelerate and benefit the rigor uh, of ESG metrics going forward? So I see that dynamic as an interesting one um, and, and certainly worth monitoring. Thank you. Um, then before turning a little bit more into that area, Keiko, does that speak, uh, did you have a further comment uh, with respect to that distinction on ESG and impact? Well, I'm, I, well, I think, you know, I agree with the judges. I think impact investing, we have to have a clear definition of the impact. As a matter of fact, I'm in a bench of IFC's definition of uh, impact investing, which not only have a specific impact investing, but even actually kind of decide ex ante what kind of impact investing is expected. Then I think we have to measure it during the course of the investment as well as after that. That's I completely agree with you. I think ESG investing, thank you very much. for that's a, that's a great statement. We should not have ESG washing. Although traditional financial investor, although they cannot ignore ESG, ESG investing anymore. They have to kind of understand what it is. Otherwise they will lose money from their investment. But I think, you know, I, I, you know, I completely agree, but I think impact investing, the measurement is more important. At the same time, we also really need to think about how to avoid the ESG washing. Thank you. Right. I think the retail investor has a right to feel confused. Um, the Wall Street Journal had a great article in 2019 where they looked at um, three funds, all of them owned both Exxon and Tesla. And in two of the funds, Exxon had a higher ESG rating than Tesla. And so how do you square that? Um, it, you know, <laughs> but that, that is what the evidence showed. So that's going to have to you know, wash through the system um, until we can have real confidence that there won't be ESG watching, washing because people will have a more shared and more rigorous definition of what it is. Yeah, Mary, may, may I? I think you, know, you, you mentioned that ESG rating and index, those ESG service companies, now I think getting bigger and bigger, I think more than a thousand index, more than 600 mm -hmm. ESG rating agencies. I think they are now competing quite a bit than a lot of consolidation working uh, happening, including like Financial Times just acquired US ESG company this morning. So more, more, more happening. if they are going to compete, then um, something, you know, sort of more standardized things may be coming up. Um, so that's, I'm hoping. Then, by the way, I think French and Dutch, uh, their version of SEC, are trying to regulate the ESG service agencies. I do think, we, we may talk about this later, but I think the EU is so far ahead of the US in really understanding and trying to regulate um, the ratings, the area, what the funds are claiming and the like. And uh, I think, it will now with the new administration come back to the United States as well. But I do think a more, a clearer regulatory framework in this case is an enabling environment rather than a restrictive one. My hope is that there's a little bit more transparency about, you know, I think we're talking about a range of things here. So, uh, uh, perhaps is slightly out of date, but I can remember being on the board of an organization 
you know, that was managing a financial institution that was managing a lot of different foundation funds. And, you know, those foundations wanted to put their money uh, uh, and have some, some portion of their funds uh, getting possibly a lower return, but, but nevertheless really uh, targeted to their priorities. And that was a place to start around impact investing where you might tolerate a range of returns that may not be full market, but still would be worth having in your mix. And then there are other kinds of investments where you may be getting market returns and maybe still others you could possibly be getting above market. Um, uh, but so there's a range and I feel like we're getting uh, often uh, these things blurred. And so there's over promising when it's perfectly reasonable to have that market segmentation uh, occur depending on the risk factors of the investments when it comes to impact. And, um, and when it comes to ESG, I have a sense uh, from some companies I've been exposed to, some have taken really deeply thoughtful, I mean, investment companies, uh, perspectives to integrate ESG into their investment process uh, about you know, whether they're going to invest in a company over the long term. While others, as you were saying, are creating a screen uh, to say they just won't invest in, in fossil fuels or they won't invest in sin areas or, or other things around which they think their customer base uh, wants to have that, that. So I guess I'm wondering, Judith, how nuanced you think these metrics are becoming to differentiate uh, between these uh, you know, different approaches so that the investor, the individual investor, you know, can make smart choices and uh, the right kind of market signaling is occurring. Um, when we started this work uh, in the mid 2000s, uh, our team wrote a research analyst report with the JP Morgan team in which we said exactly what you just said, Merit, that this was not going to be a single type of investment, that there would be a continuum from financial only to social only. And what this new evolution was going to produce is everything in between. And that there would always be those where the higher priority was the degree of social impact or environmental impact. And for others, it would be the degree of financial return with the social and environmental as the secondary. What's happened in the rush to label and to say, as this field started to grow and flourish um, more than anyone expected, I think, um, that those differences are blurred and the nuances and the distinctions stop being identified because everybody wanted to sound like they were doing the best thing. Um, but those distinctions are not only real and important, they are valuable. That is, if I'm an investor who really says, I'm willing to take a slightly lower financial return in order to achieve X, Y, or Z on my social and environmental goals, I ought to be able to find a fund that tells me that's what they do, allows me to invest and then monitor that that's what they're doing. And by contrast, if I'm an investor who says I care deeply about social purpose and the environment, but I am in this to make money as well, they should invest in a different kind of fund. It is the reason, Merit, why many endowments, university and um, uh, foundation endowments are struggling with this very issue. After all, they have a social purpose. Um, should, the, should their role be to make tons of money through their endowment investment management and then use that money for grant making or educational and fulfill their social and environmental purpose that way? Or should they blend it and the like? So all of these questions are, are really at the, they're very of the moment um, as uh, investors are really uh, struggling with it. So I think 
you pointed to labeling needs to be much better, much clearer, um, without the idea that one is necessarily better than the other. They're just different and should be useful as the asset owner decides what his or her goals are in making the investment. So that's number one. But number two, the metrics um, really do need to improve. Whether it's ESG or impact measures, um, first of all, asset owners are really assessing um, the metrics much more rigorously that their uh, money managers are using. And so they're putting pressure um, on a refinement and a much more sophisticated measurement capacity before deciding to invest um, as an LP in a particular uh, asset management firm. So that's one, I think, very positive pressure. Um, but the other is the development in the funds themselves uh, of really exciting and very rigorous um, new kinds of metrics. Um, I, we talk in the book um, just about one example, which is uh, Y Analytics, which uh, has now spun as a not-for-profit out of the RISE Fund, the TPG um, Social Impact Fund. And they had a very tough question they asked themselves when they formed the RISE Fund. Um, and that is, you know, we're a private equity firm like all the others, you know, how will we show that this is really something different? Um, they brought Bridgespan in and, and, and they worked extensively and they developed a very rigorous research driven set of impact measures. So they said to themselves, and, and ultimately their metric is called um, the impact multiple of money because they didn't just want to know, you know, what the social measure was. They wanted to know for that particular investment, what degree of difference would it make in really important things? So, and then was it worth the money that they were going to put into it so that they were sort of qualifying and quantifying. And they went to research literature. They looked at scientific evidence. They looked at um, uh, economics data in order to make that assessment. Let, let's take one example. This isn't one they did, but let's say you want to invest in an agriculture company that um, is doing uh, vegetable, uh, plant-based meat now. And um, you know we've seen the explosion of these in the market. The question that their metric allowed you to ask is how much methane in the environment would be reduced by the number of people who are the customers of this company switching from a beef hamburger to a plant-based hamburger? And is that worth the money that we're going to invest? And so they went to the research literature, which is full of really interesting studies, agricultural studies that give you the answer of, and, and allow you to quantify. It, got, it can get so differentiated that when they were, when, if you're thinking about doing it in the US, you would look at beef and methane. If you were thinking about the same kind of company in China, you would think about pork and water. And you can do that now with the kinds of research data that are available. We are seeing an explosion of, of sophisticated metrics. The problem is the problem that you articulated a moment ago. And that is all of this stuff is still proprietary, whether it's the companies doing the ESG ratings or the private equity firms who, who want to make these evaluations and then claim correctly that they've invested in them and progress. And so um, it's difficult to really, again, standardize. Uh, I think it'll happen, um, but uh, it hasn't happened yet. There will be changes. I think SASB, which was a not-for-profit effort funded by foundations, um, is one example because they are 
publicly allowing you to evaluate the so what question. Okay, what degree of materiality does this really allow and does it matter? And they're doing it um, in different sectors. So it again will allow much more differentiation than, than typical ESG ratings do. Secondly, I think we're seeing, and this is the, uh, another element of really exciting research um, coming out of the academy, we're seeing um, real live through AI and through data mining and also through satellite imaging, um, all kinds of technological advances that are allowing us to measure and make assessments that we couldn't have imagined 10 years ago. So um, I think that is really going to be transformational. And the third is, and there, um, as, as Keiko knows, I'm sure the IFC launched um, and, and initially with 60 signatories, um, an effort to go from just impact assessment to impact management and get the companies and the funds to really understand that this was a dynamic continuous process and that the investors are not only passive, but that they can contribute to and work with the companies to continue to improve um, their impact as the work unfolds. And I think that will lead to progress as well. Well, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to, I know that, um, uh, I mean, this may be a somewhat technical question, but you know, we've had some faculty um, uh, thinking about um, how do you shift uh, the timeline to promote long-term investments uh, because um, uh, particularly in areas like climate, you need to have a different timeline uh, uh, in order to make certain kinds of, 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 of investments uh, that are beneficial. Um, and the markets are, have been historically uh, encouraging a much shorter time frame. And so, um, uh, so, so you know that that's not an easy easy puzzle. Um, and I'm not sure if these new metrics are actually encouraging a longer term time frame on the part of the investor, or just different preferences on the part of uh, of the investor. Now, Keiko's been close, I know, to um, some of these metrics uh, developed by multilateral agencies like the UN and the World Bank. Do you have a comment on, do you have a perspective around that? Is it, is it a reflection of preferences that is in these metrics or is it also affecting timelines? How do you think about that problem? I'm inviting you, Keiko, if you'd like. Well, um... I think uh, in overall, because interest rate is coming down. Well, before I joined MEGA, I think in McKinsey and Company, what I'm primarily doing is the um, a lot of corporate finance issues for the financial institutions. Um, so I'm more focused on valuation of the company. So I'm actually evaluating, you know, the value of the company. That's what I was doing about 20 years. In addition to that, uh, I was in a Monday team of Lehman Brothers when I was young. That's, I was doing it when I was young. So um, from the perspective, interest rate is coming down, essentially means corporate value is the um, future cash flow discounted back by the uh, cost of capital. And cost of capital or interest rate is coming down. Nearby cash flow getting less and less relevant and longer term cash flow has more weight in the percentage of the current value of the company that's, that's been going on. So uh, that's been kind of the trend for many companies, especially in Europe and Japan. Now I think US is joining us as a lower interest rate regime. Yeah. <laughs> Believe what, I mean, well, whether you, you know, we like it or not, but that's been growing. Then, uh, so therefore we have to look at the longer term and of course, Multilateral development banks, we have to have longer term view. And especially like a developing country, we have to have a longer term view to build infrastructure. Otherwise, economy is not going to take off. That, that's being said that um, combining those, I think um, 
and also and one other thing is um, a lot of people are not only the short term, but there a lot of investors are looking at the profit one number. And that profit may not necessarily taking into the consideration of long term impact of climate. I think this COVID-19 was wake up call because COVID-19 has messed up a lot of profit forecasts of many companies around the world. So now I think we had a wake up call. Therefore, we really need to look at non-financial factors, long-term cash flow. I think, I think that's the trend. And I think MDB just been supporting it, including the doing branded finance as Judy's just mentioned. I, I would add to that um, very excellent answer the following. I think, Merit, that the, the issues are really orthogonal to the metrics question and not part of them. Uh, I, I think regardless of what your metrics are, that there is going, there is often going to be tension between the investment perspective and the perspective of the investee. So um, it, particularly in a social and environmentally relevant kind of company with goods and services. So time horizon is certainly one. Um, we tend in the social and environmental sector to look at longer term time horizons and be willing to accept them um, and um, invest in order to achieve them. Uh, and the time horizons are clearly shorter. And hopefully it will move from quarterly earnings um, to a longer time horizon, but certainly shorter than um, what our kinds of communities ask. Uh, the, the value versus values issue. The social and environmental company is leading with their values and the investor is leading with looking for value. And sometimes those two are in opposition. Um, the, as you said before, the relative weight of the need for profit versus impact will clearly be different between those two. And one of the things we try to do in the book is really articulate those, lay them out, help the reader to understand what they are and what the differences are, and, and, and then make two conclusions. One is not every investor is right for every investee. I mean, if you've been, you know, railing against corporate profits and whatever, um, and you have a big activist component to your work, you're probably not the right investee, at least at this point, um, for some of these um, investment funds. But, but to make the match work, you need to really make sure that there is an aligned corporate culture, that there is an aligned strategy, um, and that you've articulated you need to be strategic partners, not just financial partners, that you embed both organizations with the right set of skills. Um, if it's a pre-public company, do they have the right financial skills? If it's an impact company, do, do the money managers really understand and appreciate how to measure impact? Um, and then I think a, a, an understanding going in of the different rigors of the due diligence process, where we've seen the most misunderstanding and, and disappointment is that uh, often the expectations around diligence, both financial and social are just extremely different. And so thinking about those in advance um, really makes a difference too. Um, but Keiko raised you know, this moment with interest rates so low. Um, I think it's interesting to go back to a, a prior time when people thought um, the markets were pretty crazy. And that was after 2008 um, when we were in a recovery phase. Um, and we saw one very interesting example of an investor who really understood that with the financial crisis, they were gonna need to get a more stable return um, before they would re-enter aggressively into the equity markets. Um, and so they were looking for new kinds of investments. Similarly, um, and then they hooked up with and found a company, this was Pension Denmark, 
um, the investor. The company was a Danish energy company called Orsted, which used to be called the Danish Oil and Gas Company. And at the time, they were embarking on a strategy to transform themselves from a fossil fuel company to a clean energy company. So their strategies were aligned and they created a joint venture structure, which had a very innovative risk mitigation solution that's, that, that supported both of them. Um, they agreed to a profit sharing agreement under which Pension De Denmark, which had clear fiduciary obligations as a pension fund, um, was guaranteed a desired minimum return if the price of electricity dropped below a certain threshold so that they would be paid first from the fund. In return, Orsted received a larger share of the profit if the price exceeded a certain level. And they were building new plants, so they needed construction money. Um, Pension Denmark was not able to provide um, equity there and take the construction risk. So they started by providing a loan, um, which then once a wind farm was built, they converted into an equity stake. Since 2010, when they did this, they have replicated this amazing model um, in almost all of its investments in renewable energy pro projects. And it's a great example of how you can work strategically to align your timeline, your return horizon, your return obligations, and everybody sort of wins. And we want to promote more of that. We're also seeing more of that. Yeah, thank you very much. It's really great to have these examples. And, um, you know, I think you're saying many different uh, dimensions of this in your remarks. I mean, on the one hand, that example and others you speak to are really examples of creative structuring, um, uh, you know, with aligned interests of the investor and the invested uh, company um, and creative uh, structuring. On the other hand, uh, a moment ago, you were also talking about the value standardization when it comes to public markets. And, and I just wonder, um, you know, standardization is useful, uh, you know, if, uh, because there's so many different views out there and instruments and targets, and it's also hard for CEOs and companies uh, sure. to respond to shareholders who are asking for many different things. So there's a value in standardization but, but um, uh, uh, and a clarity to it, but I'm not sure standardization, what the outcome of that standardization is, is pushing towards. In other words, um, is it offering transparency or is it offering you know, consequence, uh, do you think? Uh, I wonder if you, if you think there's a, a distinction even. I, I, yes, I do think there's a distinction. So I think standardization uh, will definitely lead to greater transparency. It's inevitable because everyone will understand what the underlying metrics are and, and what they represent. I think the jury's still out on whether an ESG rated company or fund Actually, in the, the funds, we're seeing some higher performance because we have fund data. But if you disaggregate it at the level of each individual company, we need more research data to see if the um, metric that was the ESG metric actually was a predictor of financial performance at the end. Until we have those kinds of data sets, it's, it really, for me, is only a screen, a baseline, a beginning, and all of the other things I think will evolve um, and they'll be more individualized. And I think that's appropriate. I think your assessment of um, a fund that is a market basket of global funds called ESG is just going to be very different than your assessment of you know, one solar wind farm or solar or wind farm company in Europe. Um, mm -hmm. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have, you, you spoke, uh, Judith, about why analytics is an example. And I think Kiko, you spoke about an IFC and other examples. Are there any uh, metrics um, that you think are out there? Maybe this is uh, too 
inviting bias that you think are particularly good uh, that you would say for a particular purpose, this is out there, it has a lot of value, uh, you think people should pay attention to it? Me or Keiko? Either, start with Judith. No, I, I, I mean, I think that there are many at the present time, and but I think the jury is out on whether those metrics yet have demonstrated that they either maximize the financial return or maximize the impact return. Um, so that um, we need, we really need um, data. I think there are good data on the reliability. So this is a question of validity. Um, and we just really don't have uh, enough. I do think that the SASB um, approach of differentiating by sector is a very good one because clearly what you're asking for in the energy sector may be quite different than what you're asking for in the racial justice sector um, or gender impact. And we see funds that are labeled as gender funds, of interesting ones, and an increasing uh, number, particularly after last year of racial and social equity ones. So uh, again, it's a, it's a churning, interesting, frothy moment. Um, and I think we don't know the answer, but if we all say we're going to keep our rigor um, in getting the answer, I think both the answer will be quicker to come and I think the transparency will be greater. Thank you very much. Um, Keiko, uh, before we turn to questions, did you have a further comment on this? Yes, I mean, I, um, based on my research of 27 um, investors, two thirds said biggest issue for them conducting ESG invest, investing is data, data accuracy, data comparability, data availability, and also um, you know, uh, trustability of the data. I think we, we have two, two layers of the program. One is the, um, you know, what kind of data we have to have. We need a standard or the measurement. I think another one is how to collect those data. The first one, you know, for financial impact side, uh, standards are coming up, Sassabi probably best, but a lot of people kind of still discussing then. Um, but I think, you know, the actual data is now available from like MSGI, Sustainalytics and so forth. A lot of companies are emerging and they are competing each other. So I think it's better things comes out. In the impact investing side, I still think the probably the, um, the measurement tool, IFC will be the best. MIGA has very similar standards than I personally read, $27 billion worth of uh, impact investing, working with the private investor going into developing country. I think it's tough. It's quite high bar. So therefore it's high cost to collect data, but it's definitely works. So I, I would recommend that. I think uh, people kind of listening to this one, just look at the IFC website, look at the uh, bar. But I, think I would just finance. add to that to look to those who are committed to impact management, not just impact assessment, because the capacity to deliver isn't just your aspiration at the front end um, or even your data and, and how those are collected. Um, it's not a controlled clinical trial. You can go in and assess and make changes as you go along. And the notion of impact management really does do that, um, I think, in an increasingly effective way. So those companies or those funds that are committed to that would be ones that I would look to as well. Yeah, Judith, that's a great idea. By the way, those people are not doing things independently. For example, Spy Analytics, Marianne is my former colleague at McKenzie. So we talk. She's spending a lot of time with, with IFC. You know, we also spend right. time with the several different rating agencies. So we actually kind of exchanging the expertise. That's why I think, you know, I had a conversation with uh, Lokefella Foundation people when I was with McMeehan. Well, thank you. I wish you were referencing more academics because uh, I do think the academy needs to get uh, more engaged uh, and contribute uh, to this evolving landscape. Uh, and I think it is slowly, 
uh, starting to seeing that in schools of our kind. You're seeing it in business schools, of course, as well. If you don't mind, I, I, we've started to have questions, invite other questions, and I'll just draw in a few from, from our audience. Um, uh, and draw them to your attention. Um, perhaps one of the more recent ones, um, uh, starting with, um, uh, if I could ask uh, Judith, the question is, do you see any downsides from putting a lot of emphasis on rigorous measurements of impact? Does it, can, does it lead to avoiding interventions that address really difficult or complex issues? or does it introduce other distortions? So I guess there's the question of, you know, are there some problems that are so hard that now you've got this new metric, you, you're actually, you know, creating less incentives for, for, for moving money in that direction? Yeah, there, there's a very good assessment looking at all of the SDGs, the, the medic parts of the SDGs, and then all of the subcomponents and asking very rigorously, which of these goals is investable um, in the short run, which with some effort might be investable in the long run, and which of these goals is always appropriately going to rely on development or philanthropic aid. And um, there will always be some in that category. The goal here isn't to um, turn profit for every social or environmental goal. Uh, it's really an effort to get the trillions of dollars in private capital to recognize that for many areas, they can have both purpose and profit. But this will never replace philanthropy totally. It will never replace development aid. And so real clarity about what is and isn't investable, investable both saves the problem solver a lot of time and agita and makes the development agencies, the multilaterals and the bilaterals and, and the philanthropic community recognize that this is not going to um, take away from their important opportunities and obligations in many areas. Thank you. I think we have a question quite uh, is a direct follow on to that by implication, which is how do you have the philanthropic sector support innovation in the NGO sector that is supportive of this uh, set of objectives? So I think there's a lot of, of effort in the philanthropic sector to ask that question. And, and um, we are seeing so much exciting innovation in the NGO sector that's um, uh, supported initially by philanthropic activity. So one quick example, but I think it'll give you um, the Nature Conservancy funded by a number of both private individuals and um, philanthropies uh, has for years been doing amazing work in the coal field regions of um, Tennessee and West Virginia and Kentucky. Um, and they were working with um, uh, St. Paul, uh, a small uh, town on the Clinch River. Um, and the Clinch River is important because it has really incredible species of fish. Um, that are dying because of coal mining. So conservation and it was a huge and critical issue. So they worked with them. They uh, developed a strategic plan with them. Philanthropy funded it um, in order to uh, um, get them to move off uh, this kind of um, lifestyle and, and um, livelihood. And when they were successful, what the Nature Conservancy then did was they raised a $150 million fund from private investors to buy a quarter million acres of land, which they would conserve, um, turn to low carbon industries, turn to uh, replanting trees and the like. The investor made the money um, like a traditional fund and will make money when the land is sold, um, as will the local community that was brought in by the philanthropies as one of the quote investors. So you're seeing philanthropy funding the innovation 
that NG, their traditional work and then their innovation as they come into these areas in really important and significant ways. So, you know, we don't want to get out of the philanthropy business. We want to continue to fund NGOs to innovate. And one of the things we show over and over and over again in this book is how important NGO knowledge is and has been and will continue to be for this field to really take off. And we have many significant examples of that. So it's an ecosystem where all of the actors are really important. And as they're evolving, um, the field will continue to transform and there's tons of innovation going on. Well, thank you. We have many more questions we don't have time to get to and I'm very sorry for that, but we'll share them with you afterwards. I, I do feel remiss, you know, we have not talked uh, so much uh, uh, today about the effects of COVID-19 um, and its consequences. You alluded to it in your initial remarks. And I wonder, um, Judith, as we close uh, our session, if you have some observations on how you think this period is going to affect um, investment markets as well as impact investing in the future. Um, thank you for that. I, I think, regrettably, <laughs> Uh, it's, it, it is already showing that it will be transformational, regrettably, obviously, because of the impact on people's lives. But given that there, it was preceded by so much discussion about the obligation of the financial markets, the role of capitalism in this new world, um, COVID and the effects of it, as well as a lot of the social justice issues that were front and center last year, have really accelerated the view that A, financial markets cannot outrun these risks, and B, that they and companies have an additional obligation which they can no longer go back from. And so I think it will accelerate the transformation of capitalism as we knew it, um, as we move forward. I think the other thing, and this won't surprise you knowing my work in resilience, I think that um, 2020 also showed us that when we're making these investments and we're really trying to understand companies and um, how they will perform, that we need to recognize now that crisis is the new normal. And so, we can no longer look at a company's sort of individual recovery plan and say, oh, that's good. We'll assess that in our ratings. Because unless you understand what the transit systems, the vulnerability of the transit systems that get their people to work or the capacity of their health programs to really support people when they get into trouble. And so I, I'm, we're trying to promote that ESG will switch to ESGR, uh, although we don't need more acronyms because we think that unless we assess resilience as part of this, um, we're going to be significantly um, uh, wrong-footed going forward in this era of uh, increasing crisis. We need to fix the climate, we need to mitigate the risks, but we can't outrun every risk. And so we ought to assess the capacity of the company to, to really confront it effectively. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us. Congratulations on Thank this you. important new work. It's wonderful to have a chance to talk to you about it. Keiko, thank you for joining us. Thank you for teaching a course around this uh, to help us understand how to think about these challenges. Judith Roden, you're I hope you come back often and be with us at SIPA. We're so grateful uh, to have you as part of our community. Thank you again. And thank you all for joining us around the world today.